Hello beautiful people, my name is Bridget and welcome back to my channel. Hope you're all having a lovely day and today we're going to talk about Elizabeth Short, also known as the Black Dahlia. So today is episode four of Makeup and Misfortune, where I'm going to tell you the story of Elizabeth Short and I want to do something different that I don't see a lot of people doing, which is I want to tell you about Elizabeth Short as a human being. I want to tell you about her as a person, not just a victim of a crime. She died at only 22. We will talk about her early demise and everything, but I really want this to be an educational video and tell you about Elizabeth Short as a human being, as a person, as her life story. There was more tragedy in her life than just the one thing. It was a terrible thing, don't get me wrong. Having your life taken from you against your will is an unimaginable thing, but I want to tell you about her as a person. When I click on videos or I listen to a podcast about the Black Dahlia case, all I hear about is a million suspect uh, suspicions and here's who this could be and this and this and that stuff is important. It's important to talk about theories and everything but what's more important to me is Elizabeth and the fact that she was a person so let's learn a little bit about her story and we'll also talk about her demise as well because I feel like it's a part of her story of course but yeah that's what we're gonna do today. If you guys want to check out my small business theopencrypt.com I'll leave it linked down below. Um, it's where my beautiful Batwing earrings are from today. I also made some new Halloween vintage inspired puzzles and metal photographs. It feels weird to be doing a promo right now. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's that if you want to check it out. I'll leave a link down below. And also I want to note one more thing before we get into the story. I will not be showing any um, post-mortem pictures in this video. I don't feel like that's necessary and let's respect someone as a person and not just... I know crime scene photos are important and I'll look at them too, but I don't feel like for the purpose of this video that is necessary whatsoever. So we will not be showing any uh, deceased today. So let's get started with the story. As always, anything on my face, I'll just leave a link down below because it's not about the makeup products today. And I'm just trying to keep my focus on the story. So I probably won't remember to mention what I'm using. So let's talk about it. So on July 29th, 1924, Elizabeth Short was born in Boston, Massachusetts. She was a middle child, so there was five girls total. She was number three to both of her parents. Her father built many golf courses and invested a lot of money in the stock market, and her mother stayed at home. So middle of three children, all girls. Like You can imagine that she didn't get too much personal attention, but it was a very loving family. But in 1929, when the stock market crashed, Elizabeth's father, Cleo A. Short, his car was left by a bridge, the Charlestown Bridge, and it was presumed that he jumped off. They had lost so much money and all of his savings and everything in the stock market crash in 1929, and it was presumed he jumped off the bridge taking his own life. But um, after that, his mother, her mother took up bookkeeping to support the family, a family of six at that point, the mother and five girls. So she took up bookkeeping, bookkeeping to maintain the family. I'm very tongue twisted today and I don't feel like this is going to go very well, but let's keep trucking through, okay? So at age 15, this is the only time we see Elizabeth having any type of like health issues. So she has a lot of respiratory problems with like bronchitis and severe asthma attacks. And she has a lung surgery and after she has this lung surgery performed to really help her breathing and everything it is suggested she moves to like a milder climate so her mother sends her to stay with friends and family for like the harsh you know massachusetts winters and everything in florida where it's a more mild winter so that you know it's better for her health and she does that for three years and she really spends a lot of time in florida she has a lot of friends but in her sophomore year of high school she ends up dropping out, it just wasn't for her. Now get this, okay? When Elizabeth is 18 years old, she goes to move to California with her father. Didn't I just tell you that her father faked his, like he was presumed dead, like he had presumably jumped off a bridge? Yeah, homie just faked his own death to get away from his family and start a new life. He had written a letter to Elizabeth's mother apologizing for this. But you really said, hey, I'm going to have five kids with this woman and then leave her and take care of all five of my children. All five of my children presume that I'm dead. Yeah, I'm just going to start a new life. What a scumbag. So Elizabeth hasn't seen her father since she was six years old. She goes to Vallejo, California to move in with him. And after a couple months in January 1943, she moves out because they're arguing too much. They're just not getting along and she'd rather be on her own. But she's in California this time. 
So she ends up getting a job at the base exchange at Camp Cook, which is an Air Force base. Now it's called something else. I'm not really sure the name of it. Some kind of space thing. But at the time it was an Air Force base and she got a job there and she had a live-in kind of boyfriend she was seeing who was a sergeant in the Air Force. But he was reportedly really abusive to her and they end up separating shortly after that. On September 23rd, 1943, Elizabeth Short is arrested. Now you've probably seen this mugshot around. It's pretty famous. Any picture to do with this case, any picture of her you've probably seen. Um, and it's a picture of her mugshot from 1943 because she was at a local bar and she got caught by the police underage drinking. Kind of on the bar for serving her, but she did end up getting arrested for that and they took her fingerprints. Taking someone's fingerprints for underage drinking seems like an extreme matter, but you'll see how that pays off later on. So after she gets arrested, she moves on. She had that abusive boyfriend. She breaks up with him and she now has a new boyfriend who's also in the Air Force and his name is Major Matthew Michael Jordan. Gordon Jr. Michael Gordon Jr. <laughs> and him and Elizabeth are dating. He gets into a uh, airplane accident. He's recovering from his injuries from that. And he writes a letter to Elizabeth proposing marriage. She accepts and they're supposed to get married. Up until one week before World War II ends where he is in a second plane crash and it takes his life. You know, I was going to do like a really fair complexion look and then I only put concealer under my eyes for some reason. And now it just looks weird, but we're going to try to make it work. Now after her fiance dies, one week prior to World War II ending in a plane crash, she moves in July 1946. She moves to Los Angeles and she's staying in a room. She's renting a room um, with a friend, working as a waitress, and she's renting a room behind the Florentine Gardens nightclub. She has a roommate named Anne there and they're just staying there, making ends meet, working as a waitress, just getting by. It says that Elizabeth wanted to be a film star. But she never did any like type of like extra roles that we see her credited in, nothing like that. But it just seemed that like something she had in her mind that she wanted to do, she told friends about. Now on January 9th, 1947, this is the last confirmed sighting of Elizabeth Shore alive. She returns home from a leaf brief little trip to San Diego with her married boyfriend. Women, please avoid married men. You know, it's just never going to work out the way they tell you it is. But yeah, he drops her off at a hotel where she's going to be her sister who's visiting from Boston. And that is the last time she's seen. She's seen less than a mile away from there later that same night on January 9th um, at a local bar having a few drinks. But the patrons there saw her and that's the last time anyone has confirmed seeing Elizabeth Short alive. It is not until January 15th, 1947 that Elizabeth Short's body is found. So her last sighting was on the 9th. They don't find her until the 15th but no one at the time kind of knew that she was missing. I'm not sure why her roommate didn't file her as missing, but she, she could have thought that she was still with her boyfriend in San Diego and she didn't come back on time. So on the morning of January 15th, 1947, Elizabeth Short's body was found in a vacant lot by Betty Berzinger, who was walking with her three-year-old daughter. At the time, Betty thought it was a mannequin and, uh, it wasn't. She also, you know, after she saw it was a mannequin, she could have thought it was a drunk woman just passed out from the night before. And the closer she got, she realized it was a body and she ran to a nearby house and called for police to come. Now here's where it gets kind of graphic. So be prepared, but also you clicked on a video about the black doll. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure everyone knows what they're getting themselves in for. So Elizabeth's body was severed in half from the torso. It was seven and a half, drained of blood. Her skin was very pale and translucent. And she was posed with her arms above her head, her elbows bent, and her legs spread wide open. Her body was found nude. And when the reporters got news of that, they really ran with it and made it like a, a sexy story. At the time Elizabeth's body was found, she was estimated to be dead for 10 hours prior. So it was either dumped really early morning on January 15th or very late in the day on January 14th when she was dropped into a lot. They say she was not killed there because there was no signs of blood. There was a concrete, there's a bag of concrete with some watery blood in it found nearby. But on the scene, there was no blood. She was drained of it completely. So they figured that she was not killed there. It's also said that she did not die from being severed in half because there was no signs of, there was not a lot of signs of bruising near the incision mark, which says that she was dead prior to 
being dumped there. Also, there was a lot of blunt force trauma to the head and a lot of hemorrhaging out of one ear, bleeding out of one ear. So they think that blunt force trauma could have been the cause of death. There's also all kinds of various lacerations to her breast, her thighs. She had a Glasgow smile across, which a lot of people know is like the Joker smile. It's from the lip the edge of your lip to your ear, she was cut that way. Um, there's also um, just some superficial cuts, cutting off little pieces of her flesh, her tissue, off of her breasts as well. Along with the surgical precision of having her torso cut and some of these surgical lines and draining of the blood, which seemed very professional, like a surgeon did it, honestly, like or some kind of doctor, some person familiar with medicine body fluid stuff like that had done this that's what a lot of speculation still to this day is about um it's also said that a lot of her intestines were taken out of her and then stuffed inside of her like butt area they did do they checked for sperm and everything it was signs of essay um but no sperm found directly not that dna was good at the time to even like test that the autopsy also revealed that elizabeth had ligature marks on her wrists ankle as well as around her neck so it's assumed that she was tied up at some point and again no one had seen her since january 9th and she wasn't found to the 15th so who knows how long that she was trapped or you know maybe she was out living her regular life and just didn't um come home or maybe she was trapped for a few days with this individual who took her life i don't we don't know the only evidence found at the scene besides that weird concrete bag with watered down blood in it like i said was a heel mark in the dirt as well as a little bit of tire marks the tire marks could have been irrelevant but those are the only things at the scene that the police gathered as evidence now when the body was found of course police right offhand didn't know who she was but they were able to identify her by an early like an early form of a fax machine and identified her by her fingerprints taken at you know, her arrest in 1943 when she was underage drinking. So that's how they found out who she was. And I have to say the press in this case are absolutely disgusting. I mean, is that shocking? No, because usually the press is bad. I mean, a lot of the times they're doing good work, spreading the word and everything, but there's been several instances where I'm just looking at a case and I'm like, the reporters did that. And this is one of those. So the reporters, call Elizabeth's mom and they're like hey your daughter Elizabeth won a beauty contest and they try to like get information out about Elizabeth that they can like they try to get any information from the mom that they can just to uh tell her that her daughter had been murdered and they're like we will pay for your trip to California for you to come help the investigation we'll pay for it don't worry the flight and ever in the hotel stay is on us the reporters just to try to keep her away from the police and keep all the inside info on this case that the mother may have on the reporter's side. Absolutely disgusting. Now, when the reporters get a hold of this case, it's the first time we see her referred to as the Black Dahlia. Some say it's because of her admiration of thin, sheer black clothing. They also like to say that it's some kind of sex-related crime. They try to say, oh, maybe she was a prostitute, maybe she was pregnant, maybe she was a lesbian, maybe this, maybe that. Every single thing you can think of has been attached to this case at some point or another of someone trying to speculate about like why this happened to her. And at the time it was all like, the 1940s in general was like sex bad. She was pretty, must have sex, sex bad. And they ended up referring to as a sex fiend slaying in the New York Times. Oh, the LA Times, sorry. LA Times referred to this as a sex fiend slaying. And, you know, they were also trying to push the prostitute narrative as well. Which doesn't really seem necessary. And even if someone was a prostitute when they were murdered, it doesn't necessarily make it their whole identity. Now, on January 21st, 1947, a week after... Elizabeth's death someone makes a phone call to the examiner which is a newspaper and they're really happy about the coverage this case is getting they're like that they're talking about it all the time and they're like hey I'm the killer I'm gonna send you some of Elizabeth's stuff some of Beth Short's stuff and they do it comes in a manila envelope it's all written out with like newspaper clippings spelling out the words and it's just like so they say it's souvenirs of Beth Short 
in the mail. And when they get it, it has newspaper clippings, photos, a business card, note with names written on it, her birth certificate, as well as an address book that doesn't say Elizabeth Short on it. Its address book actually belonged to Mark Hansen. That's name was embossed on the cover. And that's the evidence that is seen. Also later on, on top of a trash can in a different part of town, they did end up finding one black suede shoe and a purse that did end up belonging to Elizabeth. Now quickly, let's talk about some of the initial suspects in the investigation. There's tons of suspects that have come out since there's been a, you know, tons and tons of confessions to this crime because people want the infamy and fame attached to a really famous and brutal case, which is weird. But let's just talk about a couple of the initial suspects that were on police's radar from the beginning. The first suspect was actually a note found by a riverside. This was tucked inside of a shoe by an Ostens Edge, and it was the first note claiming responsibility for Elizabeth Short's murder and apologizing to someone named Mary. They did not find a body, but they assumed that they walked into the ocean because of the note. And that was the first, like, confession for the crime. They couldn't be connected to anybody relevant. Also, isn't that first suspect who left a bunch of clothes by the ocean side, assuming jumped in the water, very similar to the fact that her father faked his own death by putting his car by the bridge? Now let's talk about Mark Hansen, whose name we probably recognized from a second ago when I told you that his name was embossed on that address book that came with Elizabeth's belongings. Also, those belongings didn't turn up any evidence. Um, there was some partial fingerprints that couldn't be recovered. But everything had been cleaned with gasoline, which is very similarly to how Elizabeth's body had been cleaned before it had been dumped at that site. So it is, you know, it's like pretty clear that that was the actual killer who called and left those letters. But let's talk about Mark Hansen now. So he was a friend. He was pretty wealthy. He owned a nightclub in town and he was a friend or acquaintance of Elizabeth's. And it's said that he could have had a motive for killing her because uh, Anne, Elizabeth's roommate, said that, like, Elizabeth had turned down his advances. And you know how men get crazy over that. So that was kind of the only thing that linked him. He was a friend. Maybe that's how she got his address book. But, yeah, that part's unknown. He was eventually cleared as a, a suspect. But her roommate did note that he was suspicious for the reason that she had turned down his advances previously. Another suspect that appeared on police's radar from the beginning was on the morning of January 15th, very early in the morning, around the time that Elizabeth was found and in the same general area, there was a man driving a sedan around trying to dump a bag of lawn clippings. Now this didn't go anywhere, this lead didn't go anywhere. However, back in 2003, one of the original investigators was still talking about like i think that was the guy and uh yeah that was it so he was technically cleared but the original investigators still think this guy dumping long clippings was hella suspicious so those are some of the initial suspects there's also a very famous doctor suspect that has come up in the last few years and it's kind of like people consider this case closed because of it i do too um but because it is not officially closed i'm not about to talk about it today i'm not i mean me talking about suspects is technically rumory, but it's just, I wanna talk about the things that initially started in the investigation before it went very cold. So let's talk about how she got the name, the Black Dahlia. Now, a lot of people agree that she did end up getting this name coined in her lifetime, not post-mortem, which a lot of people think. A lot of the experts say that she did have this nickname prior to her death, that a lot of her friends from a place she frequented, a Long Beach drugstore she frequented, had coined this name for her because of her sheer clothing or because of the fact that she had adorned her hair with the Black Dahlia flowers and just stuck as a nickname for her. And then when the press got a hold of it, they really coined it and made it look catchy. And something about the name, the Black Dahlia, um, seems very serial killer-esque, like, um, you know, like, like the torso murderer, which could be connected to this crime, or, you know, the Golden State Killer. It's the da-da-da-da, or the da-da-da. Like, it's like two or, it's like three or four syllable names for like serial killer names that I think that made the Black Dahlia with being three syllables really stick in people's mind as well as the manner of death because this isn't the normal kind of crime you see. I mean being drained of blood cut in half a uh, Glasgow smile. It's not a typical kind of crime you see so I think it really stuck in people's mind for that and then having a catchy name on top of it really stuck. 
The name could also be a play on words from the 1946 film The Blue Dahlia, starring Veronica Lake, who we talked about previously in this series. She was episode two. If you want to check it out, I'll leave Veronica's video linked down below of one of these. Um, but yeah, she died in 1947. Um, but the 1946 film, The Blue Dahlia, had just come out. It was a very popular film. So it could have been corn coined from that too. But no one knows specifically where the name The Black Dahlia come from. But it did stick because the newspapers put it in so much. But anyways, you guys, that is all I have for you today. I um, hope you enjoyed this video. Honestly, I know this wasn't like the most deep dive, true crimey video in the world. But I don't think that was the purpose of this. I really wanted to focus on telling you who she was before she died. Of course, we're going to talk about her death because it is the most notable thing. And it is what made her famous. Um, and I, I wanted to talk about it a little bit. Uh, because I don't think it should be undermined how bad it was and what she had to endure. But I also wanted to focus on the fact that she was a human being who deserves her story told, her life story told. And this wasn't the only bad, her death was not the only bad thing that happened to her. Like her father faking his death and abandoning the family, bad. Her fiance getting in two plane crashes and inevitably dying on her, terrible. You know, like it's... It's just a lot and I'm, I'm so sorry to Elizabeth Short that she had such a short life filled with terrible things and the only thing people talk about in videos or podcasts and anything talking about her, they don't talk about her as a person, they only talk about her as a corpse. Yeah. Um, so anyways, thank you guys so much for watching today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. I know it's a little more true crime in the last couple ones. Maybe you like that and I will see you guys later. Have a great day. Okay. Bye guys.